welcome to the Monday edition of the Dividend Cafe. Uh, you know, exciting weekend, exciting week ahead, and it created an exciting day today. Uh, so we're going to get into it. Market, housing, Fed, uh, the election, just, you know, all the different topics I like to cover on Monday. Uh, we are 15 days away from the election, so we're we're finally almost there. We'll have a few things to say here today and then uh, Friday. I mentioned in the Dividend Cafe a couple of days ago that this coming Friday's Dividend Cafe will be devoted to answering all the questions that we've gotten related to the election and its expected impact in markets and the economy and allowing people to get as granular and specific about questions they may have around this whole topic. Uh, that'll be what we do in Div Cafe. And you're welcome to st even send questions all the way through uh, this week. I'll probably wrap up the writing by Thursday. But up until then, if you add more, we'll cover more. So uh, questions at thebonsongroup.com if you're interested. Okay, so today's Dow uh, opened down a little bit, but then it just got worse throughout the day. Closed down 344 points, which is 80 basis points. The S&P was down 18 basis points. And the NASDAQ was up a quarter point. The only sector today in positive territory was technology, which was up uh, over 90 basis points. Uh, all, 10 of 11 other sectors were down, primarily real estate, which was down over 2%. And anything down today, it was related to bond yields uh, skyrocketing higher. And so you just had a situation where the 10-year moved up um, almost 12 basis points. So you had a big sell-off in bonds and the majority of the stock market, especially rate sensitive, small cap, real estate, et cetera, dropped uh, with bonds. Um, you know, now, put today aside for a second, coming into today, we had closed another all-time high on Friday. We had had six weeks in a row a positive performance in markets. Um, and there was significant breadth. And this is the thing I want to say about a big difference between where we are now. When I look at the elevated valuations and where we were going into 2022, which of course ended up being a big sell-off year with the NASDAQ down 30 and the S&P down 20 and all of the, the, that stuff, a big difference was that in the months leading up to what became that 2022 sell-off, the breath was already weakening. It breath has been quite strong in the market here the last couple of months as this rally uh, since early August has gathered steam. Now, there is an exception, and it's an ironic one. It's semiconductors, where actually the top part of the semiconductor space has gotten stronger in recent days and weeks, and the breadth of the semiconductor space has gotten much weaker. So I throw it out there as a rhetorical question because I think the answer is obvious, but just in case it isn't, I may, I may answer it. What is more likely? The weak space bringing down the strong names at the top or the strong names at the top bringing up the weak space? Uh, first of all, the answer is not entirely clear because there's even third, fourth, fifth options that could fit in there. But as the general rule goes, um, the, the breadth of the space matters, and it matters for the companies at the top of it as well. Okay, um, so I mentioned bond selling off. A couple of just sort of random things that were part of my weekend research that I wanted to share. 45 years ago, so I say 1980 because it was back when uh, President Reagan ran against uh, Walter Mondale, uh, excuse me, Jimmy Carter. Um, I was uh, out of kindergarten and th this was uh, the launch of a new decade. So even though 44, 45 years may seem a bit random, 1980 is a nice good line in the sand. And the U.S. was 25% of global GDP. And you fast forward today, it's basically 25% of global GDP. And so even as other countries have moved up significantly, the U.S. has held its percentage 
But when you have a lot of emerging markets that went from zero, one, and two percent to much higher, um, for the U.S. to hold its position could only have happened out of a lot of relative strength, obviously, because of math. Now, China was 3% of global GDP, and it is today 17%. That's not a bad increase on the world stage. Um, but if we were flat and China grew that much, what, from a percentage basis, largely accounts for that? Who shrunk? And it is Japan. That 45 years ago was 10%, but by the end of that decade, let's, all, let's put it this way, because I'm a big fan of cultural ma markers. 1980, Japan was 10% of global GDP. When Die Hard came out, it was 18% of global GDP. And some of you will know why I picked that movie as the marker to, with the peak GDP uh, representation that Japan had on the world stage. Uh, it is now, are you ready, 3%. So basically, China and Japan swapped from 3 to 18 and 18 to 3, and J China from 3 to 17. So um, economic empires come, economic empires go. Uh, it can take centuries but sometimes it can take just decades. I, I'll add to this, by the way, I wanted to mention India was barely 1% of global GDP 30 years ago, uh, go, starting you know, into the 1990s. It's over 4% today. It's more than quadrupled in a few decades. They are headed by IMF forecast and other uh, fallible but reasonable estimations to be um, double four percent, you know, somewhere around seven, eight, nine in less than a decade. So massive relative and absolute economic growth out of India. Uh, there's a chart at Divin Cafe you're gonna have to go to to look at that shows a correlation between Bitcoin and the NASDAQ going back to January of 2020. It's a nearly perfect correlation. Do with it what you want, but it's worth looking at. Um, I gotta write a, I gotta write a, uh, a div cafe about crypto one of these days if I get the energy to do it. Uh, but the point here is a rather obvious one. It's very highly correlated with, um, the risk asset that is in NASDAQ. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned the election is 15 days away. I don't want to get into the polling um, the momentum, the models, you know, some of the things I could share will, will do bode well for the Trump candidacy. Some of the things I could share bode well for the Harris candidacy. Um, I would like to just be an objective uh, messenger. But first of all, I think everyone has other sources besides my investment commentary that they can go to for that purpose. And so it's sort of an asymmetrical risk reward for me because I don't think it really produces a lot of benefit for you all with me uh, regurgitating polls that are available at plenty of other online sources. And then um, I think the, the, there is a tendency to want to blame the messenger for the message. So it's a, it's a very, very, very tight election. And uh, we have 15 days till we're going to hopefully know a lot more. Um, so why are bond yields up? Why are they around the 4% range instead of 3.6 or 3.7 where they were? Um, look, it's really quite simple. Retail sales were strong. Unemployment uh, has been low. Uh, Atlanta Fed GDP estimates are strong, over 3%. The soft landing camp or even a strong landing camp is winning. Uh, there's been solid data there. That changes when it changes, but that's the reason bond yields have come up. Higher expectations for uh, nominal GDP growth and of the nominal GDP, primarily the big change has come in real GDP expectations. All right, and then a few data points around housing. We're going to spend some time here in housing real quick. Uh, housing starts declined half a percentage point in September. They're down over half a percentage point from a year ago. A year ago, housing starts were pitifully low, and they're down from there. 
So that's pitifully lower. Two years ago, it was pitiful. Each year, they've gone lower, not higher. So you have bad data that you're not getting enough starts, and then you're getting less starts. How does this happen? It's a decision. It is a choice. It's not just an uh, anecdote or a circumstance. And although the September report was primarily due to multifamily decline, which is an, uh, a category of housing starts that has seen a lot more supply, but only recently show, slowed down because of cyclical realities, um, the single family starts have just simply uh, lagged and, and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Uh, mortgage applications for new purchases are down well over 50% from where they were just two plus years ago. And then the very recent NAHB, NAHB Home Builder Sentiment Index came in at 43, well below 50. Expectations are doing slightly better. Present situation, prospective buyers are really low. Home Builder Sentiment. Um, Federal Reserve, 91% chance of a quarter point cut next month. 77% chance of a quarter point cut in December. 0% chance in the futures market of anything uh, higher than a quarter point cut at both of the meetings. Uh, and there's some chance, even though it's slim, of no cut at one or both. 90 and 77 being the odds for a quarter per meeting. Per meeting. WTI crude closed just its hair below $70. It's up 1.7% today, but uh, still a little bit below 70. Energy stocks were down last week. Oil itself was down 6.5%. Canadian midstream was a bright spot, uh, did well. Natural gas pipeline companies, when they weren't focused on natural gas liquids, the processing side of the business, but the transportation around uh, NGL had a very good week. Uh, not a surprise as U.S. oil field production is at an all-time high, 13.5 million barrels per day. I am sure you will see commercials from Vice President Harris bragging about that in the 15 days to come. I just. Um, read Against Doomsdayism in Dividend Cafe today. Uh, Pre-industrial farming. Let's just say when you look at modern farming, the treatment of animals, the uh, results, the economic productivity, the ease, uh, the living conditions. Let's just say um, I'm staying light on details on purpose. Uh, the evolution of farming does not allow for a doomsdayism. Okay, I'll put it that way. Um, somebody asked and asked TBG, and I'm going to close out with this point. What is the right interest rate level short term? Uh, this person is a saver and they weren't getting any interest income for so long. And now they've been getting really good interest income for the last couple of years. But what's the sweet spot? What's the right amount? And I, and I answer the question by saying <clears throat> in a perfect world, Lenders and borrowers determine the amount. You make a market. And of course, it doesn't end up just being one person with one bank. It ends up being gazillions with gazillions. And the need for a central bank to control what the cost of capital will be via the setting of the uh, Fed funds rate that is the rate uh, banks will pay for short-term lending, um, that need for manipulation or alteration goes away if there were peer price discovery from lenders and borrowers. I freely recognize we don't have that system and I'm very skeptical we're going to have it again in my lifetime. But um, the, the reason why I say this caveat is I don't want to answer what I think the, the short-term interest rate would be. And I don't want the, the, the smart folks at the Federal Reserve to answer either. But to the extent that uh, it is not going to be set by markets and it will involve human fallible decision making, what I would say is that if the question is meant for what's the neutral rate, what's a natural rate at which there would not be contraction 
because it's too tight or uh, accommodation and stimulus because it's too loose. And I would say that number is uh, roughly around 3%, that our current roughly around five is still contractionary. Uh, if they were to go back down to the zero bound, it would be extremely loose and, and probably recklessly so. Um, so I, I have the general feeling that the number is somewhere into the threes and that they've got to work their way down there. But again, I think that that is assuming one wants to get to neutral. Um, and I'm not sure that that is the policy objective. And that's based on my own belief that the nominal GDP right now, at least, with a little bit of better economic growth expectations out there, if you can get 2% real GDP growth and 2% inflation for 10 years, that should leave you about a 4% 10-year. And if you have about 1% for term premium, that should mean that the short end of the curve would be around 3%. Uh, you can alter some of those numbers a bit, but that's the back of napkin. And, and uh, again, we have a central bank that is setting that short-term rate, uh, but we have a market that's setting the 10-year. So there you go. I'm going to leave it there for the uh, week. I love the Monday Dividend Cafe. I hope you've gotten a lot out of this. More fun things if you want to check it out online and feel free to share it, forward it. And in the meantime, uh, we'll be with you each day this week. I already have uh, some content I'm working on for tomorrow's daily recap. Uh, Brian will be with you in the podcast each of these next couple of days. And then uh, Friday, a special election Q&A Dividend Cafe. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thank you for reading The Dividend Cafe. Mm -hmm.